Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Ostrowski. I'm with the JHU uh, Galaxy team, and I'm going to be presenting a lot of work that has been done by Alex Mahmoud, as well as some updates on that work that has been done by myself and Anna Zafkamp on the continuous testing of continuous galaxy tools. In recent years, methods of deployment of Galaxy have improved uh, significantly. Furthermore, uh, a lot of them have been um, deployed in single user instances that are not in standard traditional methods, a lot of them being uh, cloud deployments. The most common of these being Anvil and Terra, uh, in which every Galaxy deployment is a single user interface. Uh, to that end, a lot of tools that are run within these environments are being run differently than they normally would, and therefore have to, we have to account for that with testing. Alex Mahmoud, uh, therefore, this is not switching slides, uh, set up a new GitHub repo, uh, Galaxy Testing, on the uh, Anvil GitHub repository uh, that uses GitHub Actions to set up and deploy uh, a GKE cluster, to deploy Galaxy Kubeman on that, access that instance as a remote single user, pull all of the tools from a list of uh, tools that are within that repo, within a YAML file, run all of the standard tests of, uh, for those tools within that, and then generate a report and update a readme available in this repo. And this is what it looks like. You can see on the left, there is uh, this, the reports for all of these. Uh, it breaks this list of tools that it has into 14 uh, groups. So, and runs the tests twice a day. So over the course of one week, it tests all 14 chunks. So every week it tests all tools available on these instances. And then it stores these results on the readme so that you can access the results at any time for any given test. Um, so currently this test is being performed by 211 tools uh, with uh, 1,077 tests running every week. Uh, in the last, last week, 55 of them have been erroring and 91 of them have failed for various reasons. Um, some of them for a lack of, of test data that is required for that, uh, for, the, for it. So reference data is normally available outside uh, of these uh, containers that would be deployed on a Galaxy instance is not normally available. So that's one reason. It could be an actual issue of a tool that we need to follow up on. Thing is, that's not fully available from this repo, and this is where uh, where Ennis and I have been improving on this. So reacting to some of the failures uh, that need improvements on for this repo, we have very little temporal resolution. So again, tracking tool failures, if it's a transient issue where it's failing a single time, or if it's an actual problem that we need to address. Furthermore, there's no real way to see at a glance how many tools are failing or if there's an actual issue that's going on or if it's just a single tool that's having a problem. So some solutions, uh, we are converting this landing page that exists as now as the couple slides ago uh, to keep track of sequential tool fails, as well as listing all of the tools that are failing on that front page and moving that current list of, of recent testing sessions um, onto a deeper page. And we will add to our resolution by having a list of errors and failures as things pass or fail. Um, back to the most recent pass. So we can see if it's failing several times in a row, if it's aired out a couple of times, or if it's just a single error since, uh, since it's last pass, and we might not need to check it out quite yet. In summary, new repo for cloud deployment for tool testing, uh, which continuously tests all tools on a deployment uh, and, uh, and generates user readable reports. And we will be adding at a glance summaries uh, of the current state of all tools on those instances, as well as temporal resolution of those tests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions from the people in the room? Yes. Is there an easy way to figure out like what happened since the last pass? Uh, the tool you please has changed repeat or... the question. Is there a way to find yeah, no, no. out? Can, can no, I was, I was waiting for her to finish the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah, what went wrong? Um, in, in, is there a way to track the previous fails? Yeah, to the last passing. Ah, um, currently, it's not particularly easy. That's part of what this is, is meant to fix. So that uh, currently, the front page can, uh, shows the most recent and the one before that. And all of the all of the tests are stored on that in the standard Galaxy tool test HTML and JSON files. 
but you would have to dig and spend dig to find that, which is part one of the one of the issues we are hoping to, to fix with this work. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Stephen Shank, um, who's going to present us the observable HQ project for Galaxy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So yeah, my name is Stephen Shank. I'm a software developer in uh, Sergey Pollan's lab at Temple University. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation for the chance to tell you all about the observable galaxy, which is our efforts to uh, integrate the Galaxy project with a new notebook, uh, JavaScript notebook platform known as Observable HQ. Okay, so first I just wanted to say a little bit about visualization in JavaScript. So JavaScript has a rich ecosystem for uh, user interface design and uh, data visualization. It's, you know, the language of user interfaces for the web, so it receives a lot of attention from you know, big players like Google and Facebook. Um, it also has a, you know, ever-growing and very strong uh, data visualization component. So uh, this gentleman right here, if you if you don't know him by name, I, I guarantee a lot of people have uh, come across his work at uh, one point or another. This uh, gentleman's name is Mike Bostock. He's the uh, creator of the D3 framework, which is a very, you know, low-level uh, graphical primitive framework that spawned a bunch of other uh, higher-level libraries. And he's now the chief technical officer at Observable HQ, where he's, you know, uh, putting all his chips on this uh, notebook pack platform. And so, yeah, so in, in addition to, uh, you know, D3 and frameworks that spawned it, like for instance, Vega Lite is an interactive uh, grammar of graphics. There's also structural viewers, interactive structural viewers that are programmable, like NGL. There is uh, packages for multiple sequence alignments, like our lab has one. Uh, called alignment JS and uh, phylogenetic trees as well, and really more than I could uh, fit on a single slide. And so, just a little bit about the platform. I mean, why another platform? Well, I mean, number one, it's it's JavaScript. A lot of people might you know think Python or R in this space, but JavaScript is also a strong contender with um, a lot to offer. Um, it's it's very feature rich. Again, more features than I could uh, go in on a given slide, but. One that I've found really pleasant is uh, they, they've solved this problem of you know rerunning the code when uh, variables change. So they, they use what's called a reactive data flow model, where all your variables are parsed and the, the directed acyclic graph is built up, so that whenever one variable changes, uh, the, the other only what needs updating is updated. And so it sort of solves this problem of what cells do I uh, need to rerun when something changes and in what order. And so, you know, they have widgets for uh, exploring this. And then it also has a really rich, well abstracted stateful UI where the state is pushed all the way down to the level of the variables. So you can, you know, get a, a range slider, you know, with some, with some Java uh, script code, a one liner, and a, a view of direct directive immediately binds uh, the input to that widget to uh, a variable n. And that variable n is now uh, accessible anywhere in your notebook. And so there, I mean, there, there's a lot there. There's a fork and merge based uh, functionality similar to GitHub for, you know, collaboration. There's an import and export uh, modularity. So you can import uh, data from one notebook, code from one notebook. There's markdown and latex support and plenty more. And so with that little introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce our efforts to integrate the two. Uh, so the, the Galaxy platform and the Observable HG notebook platform. So this is a, uh, an example of a intrahost variant calling workflow that I'll have a little bit more uh, to say about later, but uh, just to give an idea of what we've done here. So we've created a data type and a, an associated display application to uh, integrate these two. 
Uh, it helps you productize these workflows and create shareable links over the web that are easy, easily accessible from your Galaxy history via this uh, display application. And the idea is that users, you know, with uh, with requiring minimal, minimal demands on your users, such as the ability to uh, load accessions and upload a reference, you can run a workflow, get this display application and link out to a dashboard that can you know, also be shared with a relatively short uh, URL. So this can be shared you know, over email, over social media, uh, et cetera. And so we, we really wanted to take a, you know, to, to try to seamlessly integrate these two platforms and I'll spend the next two, two or three slides telling you how we did that. Uh, so like I mentioned, there's a data set and a tool. The data set is just uh, JSON with a few uh, required fields and there's a tool to generate it. Um, one required field is a notebook, a notebook that takes, you know, a username and the name of the notebook on the observable platform that you're going to be sending data to. And this is available to you in the tool. And then the tool will automatically extract the history ID. And I think some things are cutting out at the bottom. I'm not sure. I don't know if there's a full screen that I should be utilizing. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so yes, so the tool uh, will automatically pull the uh, history ID out, and then it'll automatically pull uh, the ID of this JSON as well. And this is really all you need to sort of really seamlessly uh, interconnect these two. So I've given that its own name, what I call payload, because it really gives you everything you need. And then it allows for a variable number of key and data set ID pairs. So you're allowed, you can select uh, either in your history or from a workflow, a variable amount of data sets. And this tool will allow you to assign a key uh, to those data sets and automatically extract the data set IDs in it. So as I mentioned, there's a tool and there's a, a associated display cap application as well. And so what's happening on the observable side, so we build up using their code modularity, some uh, functions to sort of make this easy for our users. So we utilize the uh, Galaxy REST API. Uh, we have some utilities for auto-fetching the data. So tried to make this as simple as I could. It's a two-liner. You have to import the auto-fetcher from the main uh, utility page and then call the auto-fetcher and it will immediately populate the uh, data sets associated uh, with the keys in a, a JavaScript object on the observable side. And um, we also have, there's a few more utilities, more than I can go into right now, but we have uh, functionality to link back from observable into Galaxy. So if someone's looking at your notebook and they'd like to know, well, what was the Galaxy history that uh, generated this? Can I tinker with this in the notebook? Can I tinker with the data sets in the history? There's, you know, functionality that again, we try to make it easy to just uh, connect right back to it. So we're really aspiring here for reproducible, what I call clear box uh, biological big data analysis. So clear box in the sense that you can, you know, look at any aspect, shine a little light with a, with a notebook on, you know, some data set. I would say that you know, you really want to do the giga and terascale data processing within Galaxy and, you know, cut it down to uh, kilo and megabyte scale in observable just because you will be uh, sending data over the web via the REST API, but it's a caveat. So, so some people, it's a natural question to ask why a payload? I mean, what does this really give you? And it's really, I hope I can convince you that it's for shareable seamless integration and enhanced productivity to, you know, move data in and out of these uh, two platforms. So you really, anything you need to share it, you just put it all in this observable JQJSON and you have the data set ID for that, that allows you to go and fetch everything else. So for instance, the notebook URL tells Galaxy how to send uh, the user to observable through the, the display application. Uh, the history ID allows you to fetch history information that you can link uh, from observable back to Galaxy or uh, to fetch data from observable. Um, multiple data set IDs allow you to pull these out of Galaxy. And it's really all just, if you, if you just take one ID for the data set that uh, holds all this information, that's really all you need. You get a nice uh, short URL and multi-data set visualization from Galaxy, which is you know, a, a continued topic of interest. So a little bit about how it integrates with um, workflows and collections. So you can use this um, in a workflow. In fact, I found it convenient to have several of these per workflow because there might be several different visualizations that you would like to see uh, from a history. Uh, and you can, like I said, multiple data sets per um, payload. There's a work in progress integration with collections. So at the moment you can run this on a collection and you will get a, uh, 
an absorbable HQJSON or payload associated to each element of the collection. And then uh, much more work in progress is that we're doing some work trying to automatically extract the data set IDs out of a collection so that can be fed into observable and observable will have all the IDs in that coming from that collection. And it's there's a proof of concept there, but it's it's not quite as seamless, but it can be done. And it's, it's something I, I will probably try to pick some people's brains about this week. <clears throat> okay, so I wanna go to uh, two examples. So again, this is this um, intro host example. So we had the, the privilege of working with the Galaxy team as part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there are some uh, intra-host uh, variant calling on deep sequencing data for uh, coronavirus workflows that were published in Nature Biotechnology. And there was sort of a, uh, an associated dashboard that was kind of you know built up and you know used for several different data sets like the Boston data set is a popular one and there were, there were a few others, but it, it sort of really always involved several of the key people who knew the different stages of the workflow to you know, go from raw reads to this dashboard. And so what this uh, ex extraction really helps you to do is anyone can run it if they have accessions and a reference and then they can go share the results of such an analysis uh, in whatever way they deem appropriate. And just to, to show what it looks like on the observable side, so you have a table here, with a you know, list of accessions that you were ran. We have a drop down here in the lower left corner. It's actually an auto type, so you can type in the accession and that will give you more information of, you know, visualization on that particular session, uh, accession. So you have, you know, uh, variant frequencies according to their uh, mutation class. You have a genome-wide uh, variant browser with a brush functionality that you can, you know, select and kind of zoom in on a particular region. And then once you're zoomed in on that region, you can hover over a particular variant and get a lot more information from a tooltip. And then these variants are clustered according to these to their uh, frequencies at which they were called with. So it really kind of enables you to do a, a deep dive on your, on your data and lots of data and uh, drill down on exactly what's going on. And then as another example, so this is uh, SARS-CoV-2 structure and evolution. So this is the uh, high five fixed effect likelihood method ran on 8,000 genomes from the Viper project, so the virus, uh, virus pathogen resource. Uh, database. Um, we do it all in Galaxy. We uh, map these to a reference, uh, compress them down to, you know, extract out a few based on uh, diversity and uh, phylogenetic clustering. We build trees, build alignments, and do uh, statistical tests for either positive or negative selection. And then we map those uh, selected sites uh, to a structure using the uh, NGL viewer and, you know, show uh, on the spike protein where uh, sites under selection lie relative to uh, an antibody in SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, we were interested in doing this because we have some colleagues that are interested in looking at the implications of negative selection for vaccine design. So in terms of privacy and sharing, uh, it currently required, requires either you sharing your history or utilizing your API key. And at the moment, this is on our instance where we have enabled cores for uh, cross-origin resource sharing for all of our users. So this does emit a small attack vector you can, you know, for one example, cover up your API key. So if you're in observable, so if you're comfortable with, with this as an administrator, you could share this, but there is a vector there if you're working with very sensitive data. So something like single use tokens, single use access tokens would, would be preferred, which I understand is in the works. And we're cur currently exploring a full embedding, but uh, that work has not yet begun. So for future work, uh, there's a demonstration um, on Wednesday, I'd like to get better collection integration, uh, utilize the API better. There's uh, more utilities to be developed on the um, observable side and in embedding it fully in Galaxy. And then there's nothing really special about observable. You could, you could really target an, uh, a UR, an arbitrary URL and then build some client libraries, you know, maybe just in, in a pure JavaScript like NPM library to you know, sort of more seamlessly uh, consume uh, data sets from the REST, REST API. So in summary, we've uh, demonstrated a proof of concept integration of the observable HQ notebook notebook platform with Galaxy. We've created an associated data type tool and display application. Uh, it's available on GitHub in the test tool shed. We've uh, integrated it with uh, several charting frameworks of which structural viewer, uh, sequence alignments and trees and we've productized um, existing workflows. And so with that, I'd like to thank my boss, uh, Sergey Pond, Anton Nekrotenko, whose enthusiasm for the idea motivated the development, Alex Ostrowski, who you know I thought had a really great idea that I 
you know, was interest, uh, really interested in developing. Uh, Hadley King helped with administration and has some really good work to sort of tie researchers and full reproducibility in biocompute objects to this uh, idea. And uh, some collaborators at Temple who helped get uh, the analyses together. The Galaxy team had really great suggestions on workflows and how to use uh, the platform and our collaborators at George Washington University who motivated some of the analyses and the funding from the FDA. And with that, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one time for one question from the audience, and I'll kindly of ask you to repeat it for the people online. So, that you're sure. so if there are no questions, uh, and also no questions online, um, I would have a question. And uh, did you consider like integrating also other like popular visualization tools such as Plotly or um, like other Python-based uh, tools? So the question was, did we consider integrating uh, other popular tools like Plotly or other Python-based tools? So the utility of this would probably mostly be in JavaScript at the moment. And I believe there is a Plotly client, client in JavaScript. And then you could probably import Plotly into Observable, or you could also um, write a JavaScript client that, you know, uh, a website that you wrote yourself that uses Plotly could consume. So it's yeah that that goes to the arbitrary URLs and it's definitely definitely of interest. But yeah, I, I could see multiple ways in which it could be done. Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, thanks everyone. We can move on. So our next speaker is Jada Joshi uh, from the Learner Institute. And the topic of his talks is uh, Galaxy in Notebooks. Please. Uh, so good afternoon all. So as the title of my talk suggests this, uh, uh, where the analysis begin Galaxy in Notebooks. So as the title of my talk suggests, in this project, we try to combine Galaxy and notebooks together. Uh, uh, so first, I want to give you a little bit about the Galaxy and Jupyter notebooks. So as we all, 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 all already are aware of, that Galaxy and notebooks share some kind of functionality in terms of like both, both the tools are web-based application and they provide an excellent uh, 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 reproducible data analysis system. So in terms of uh, the get on flexi provide the water flow system uh, uh, and uh, the Jupyter lab uh, uh, with the Jupyter lab. There are some issues with the sharing issues No. Yeah. So, uh, like, both the tools are a, a excellent in terms of the reproducibility. Uh, uh, so, next slide. Let's go. You can just come to it. Yeah. My fear is not working. It should be. <laughs> So Jim is a, basically an open source Jupyter Lab extension, which is implemented based on the Galaxy API. And uh, uh, it is accessed via uh, the Jupyter Lab extension interface. It's an integrative GUI based uh, 
interface of gym provides capability to interact with the local as well as uh, public galaxy server from jupyter lab via user friendly widgets with gym researcher can graphically interact with the various uh, galaxy instances and can access the tools history and different uh, galaxy ob uh, objects are under the node uh, so this is how a galaxy uh, interface uh, looks like under a notebook where user can access a galaxy instance and as you can see the lab website you can access all the tools which is available on a particular galaxy instance so here uh, uh, we try to demonstrate like how gin uh, like you can run a tool uh, which is present inside the galaxy instance and uh, uh, once you run the tool, so it shows you that uh, uh, the status update. And uh, uh, once the job is completed, you can also access like all the results and data on the inside the Jupyter Lab. I also want to talk a little bit some of the unique feature of Gene. So is that uh, you can access multiple Galaxy instances under a node notebook and all also at the same time you can access all the tool which which is present in different complex instances i also want to share uh, uh, something about the data sharing tool where uh, you can share uh, the data objects between the tool which is not present in into the same galaxy instances uh, uh, so it's a small demonstration about it. So like here, uh, uh, like I'm trying to share a data object which is present on the Galaxy main server to local server. And not only you can share the data object across the different Galaxy instances, but the other server. So like here is the example is the gene pattern server. So where you, you can send uh, the data from a Galaxy instance to a gene pattern server. So later on, little bit, I want to talk about uh, the implementation data. So uh, gene uh, has been implemented based on the Galaxy API and uh, uh, the, uh, the gene extension is, uh, uh, is a NPM package, which is implemented based on the Python and Java JavaScript. And uh, uh, it can access uh, 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 the objects and uh, like the data objects and all these things uh, uh, through uh, the API call and can populate uh, uh, the, uh, the tool form and execute the job and can upload the data that's it uh, from a Galaxy instance. Uh, Although there are some of the limitation with this tool right now, uh, so uh, you can't currently access the workflow through it, and also uh, the currently the client side components uh, of uh, Galaxy are not available as a package. So we have to build uh, the form and the other functionality by our own. And uh, the data sharing between the different Galaxy instances and between different sort of work, actually first need to download the data inside a Jupyter uh, Lab server, and then it uploads the data to various server. In the future, we would like to uh, like in, implement data sharing so that it can stream the data directly rather than the download and upload. Uh, so, uh, in summary, Jin is an open source Jupyter Lab ex extension which is implemented based on the Python, ja JavaScript, and Node.js module. It allows this researcher to intermix the Python and R programming languages graphically, and user can access all the uh, like different Galaxy instances under Jupyter Lab. Currently, is available as uh, uh, like uh, uh, npm and 
the IPI package, and uh, uh, it also can be run via DOM very much. I also want to acknowledge my uh, team at uh, Cleveland Clinic and the Jane Patton team. Yes. What's the quota, you know, on Jupiter Lab? What's, What's your quota of uh, file size? Uh, so actually, currently we are running uh, uh, like uh, there is no particular limit in terms of the file size you can like upload and uh, download as large as possible. I would also have uh, a question. You mentioned in your talk that um, this currently doesn't yet work with workflows. Uh, what would be needed to make this work with Galaxy workflows? So uh, we actually haven't tried it. So like, uh, uh, so it's like still uh, in the process of in implementation. So like uh, in the future, we have to plan need to implement that part. Okay. Yes, one more question from John. Thanks, So if I understand your question correctly, uh, uh, the way we implemented the gene pattern part, uh, so like, uh, can you repeat your question one more time? Sure, sure. These visions that we have, so these with nice embeddings in the internal textures that that you that you can use it on other websites. Uh, like actually, it is uh, based on the Java script, and like all the code uh, uh, can be implemented for the other website also. But you can't use the same code like uh, if you have some a API functionality for other the website so it can be done but like you have to write the code for it it can be integrated as a, a extension thank you thank you very much once more <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Sven Gunnarsson from Elixir Norway, and he's going to present the Galaxy Pro 2 2.0 Redux. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, Galaxy Pro 2.0 is a Redux, a dynamic tool prototyping user using interactive tools. So why the 2.0 Redux? Um, we, I have presented the Galaxy Proto 1.0 in conference in 2015 in Norwich, and there was a demonstration of real time coding of graphic user, user interface, which failed. Spectacular. <laughs> and we remember that. And yeah, I managed to <coughs> actually use a uppercase character instead of lowercase characters. The reason I found upwards. Anyway, there's been no live demo today. <laughs> Be <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't have time to delve much into the backstory here, other than um, this was uh, started actually 
a long time ago in 2008, we developed the genome tracker browser, which was the uh, very beginnings of Galaxy. Also, we rushed off and did our own thing related to how to swear. Um, and then we are starting to try to sort of bring our stuff back into the fold. Um, after some years now, we are trying again um, for the 2.0 Redux. Um, so basically, what we are suggesting now is to uh, have a, it's a general suggestion of a new type of tool to be added to Galaxy. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the proto part is, is the containerized, and that's not really. Uh, in Galaxy so, so it's more general than that. Um, so if the get is accepted and merged, then we can add the hundreds of things that we have for analysis of genomic intervals uh, or tracks, um, but we should probably not add it. Um, yeah, so there's a poster. This thing is new. Um, okay. Here. Yeah, so um, the poster is uh, virtual for now. Uh, it's actually in a pit house by Tennis with Merck, which will be here tomorrow, um, but it's also online. Um, so I'm just going to go through uh, some parts of the poster. To present what this is actually about. Um, so let's just have an overview. Uh, there's currently, in my mind, there's three types of tools in LC, and so there's actually 33 on the, on the counting, but yeah. Um, but mostly for the user, that's sort of the main experience, I think. Uh, one type of tool is called the data source tool, and that's where you branch off of Galaxy and go into an external website. To fetch some data, and then you come back to websites called an API, and there's a tool that started to actually import the data. Um, and Scary can do sort of anything that's that's it, whatever can do on the website. Right? And then you have the interactive tools, which are really neat. Uh, that's where you then start up a tool in the Galaxy container. I'm oh, sorry, Docker container, um, and it's, uh, you open a new window. And can do whatever here, like with lab or with this little. Um, and then you have the general regular tools where things open up in the middle panel and you select things, it's more limited and less dynamic. So, what we want to do is to mix all of them up and came up with our new type of tool, which is a combination of the data source tool and regular tool. We call an interactive client tool. Um, so basically, uh, here you instead of branching up into your window, you get the uh, contents into the middle panel. Um, so it's actually a data source tool. Uh, but the source of the data is not external, it's internal. So that's the interactive tool that starts up, which provides the data. And the tool itself works on as a server. And you will have the tool running uh, for, I mean, days really. Uh, and every time you sort of start a tool, a client tool, it just contacts the running Docker uh, tool in the background. And then you have the regular tool mode. So when you execute from the interactive tool, it starts regular job, Docker job that runs and can run using the normal job runner in the office. Um, yeah, so we have implemented a demonstration on this and are quite close to having a good test ready. Um, I will not go into the proto research. So this is basically a way to go from uh, Python code, pure Python code, into graphical user interface. Maybe more about that later. And there's more to this. So we also managed to uh, use this as a way of um, programming so we can use Galaxy as an integrated development environment um, and do tool prototyping on the fly on Galaxy server that you're not going to follow just as a regular user. So basically, 
what we, you do is you open up a message um, tunnel to the attractive tool running a stopper container. And then you can use a simple syncing, which is syncing the code from the laptop onto that container. And you get the visualization inside Galaxy. Yeah. So I can go into that in detail in the demonstration on Wednesday and the also the session of closer tomorrow. Um, yeah, so I think I'm over time. Um, if I have one minute, I can also show it. Uh, you know what? No. Yeah, yeah, no, you have a minute. Yeah. Even so, at four. That's the one. Ah, sorry about that. I just need to browse it actually. So. Yeah, so this is now running um, actually using Podman instead of Docker. Uh, so you might just make that work also. Um, so basically, you open up tool there as a test tool. And um, well, it says now that there's no interactive tool running. So you can start up this service. Um, and then this interactive uh, server is started on the back end. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so the, the um, upper container is now starting. And if I open up this tool again, now it connects. Well, I wait some more seconds, I suppose. Yeah. What I need to log in. So that was that email. <laughs> <Tell> the <data. laughs> okay, so on Wednesday you will see this <laughs> Thank you very much for this preview to this really cool technology. Um, are there questions from the audience? Are there any other questions from the online community? Doesn't seem like that. If not, I mean, I guess uh, I have a question. So, uh, what's the last step in your app for? Um, I mean, you can have this as a finished tool if you like, uh, or you could create the regular Galaxy tool if, if that's. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, depends on the tool, right? So, if you are using functionality that you cannot really translate the Galaxy tool, then you can just have this running as a regular tool. I would have one more question. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, when you are done prototyping, is it possible to export it then to an XML and to have it as like a normal Galaxy tool? Uh, mm, that's everything's possible, but that's not part of the project. No. <laughs> okay. So you have to do that yourself. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you think this is like really like is it really a lot simpler for people to prototype the tools in this way compared to the classic XML writing way? Um, I'm not sure uh, to be honest. I mean that would be up to, to uh, the users to decide. Uh, what is very powerful with this method is that we can have functionality up running very quickly for. Other users to, to try out. So, if you're developing for other researchers and they can try out straight away with the large data set and keep on running on Galaxy, and even if there's a bug, you can just go in and uh, change it on the fly and fix the bugs. Really, so that's not very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this really cool talk. And this will be the end of the panel.